my name is Rick Telberg for CPA Trendlines, and I'm thrilled today to be hosting this session with Robert Flegel of RF Resources. Robert Flegel is the preeminent mergers and acquisitions broker in the New York City area. He also specializes in executive placement. He has a very good understanding for how to position your firm, your book of business, and your career for capitalizing on today's trends and issues in the COVID age. Robert Flegel, take it away. All right. Well, thank you, Rick, and thank you for that really excellent introduction and for inviting me and asking me to do this. And uh, welcome to everybody online. Um, it's nice to be doing a national teleconference. I am beaming here from Larchmont, New York, which is a small suburb of New York City, about 30 miles outside of New York. And uh, good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you all are. So thank you all for coming. And um, you know, our topic today is a, is a really important topic. Um, I think every CPA firm, every business out there has to think about what's gonna happen next. And we are obviously living in incredibly unprecedented times. Um, you know, COVID-19 has just changed the landscape of our lives completely, whether it's uh, your, your health, the virtual workforce and what that's gonna mean going forward. Um, business collections are not the same. Um, you know, certain industries have obviously been hit very hard. So there's a lot of factors going on now that are affecting business in general. And that's, you know, part of the reason why we're having this call. And you add on top of that, what's going on in the rest of the world, and it's especially in this country, which we're not going to get into, obviously, but there's obviously a lot of discontent, a lot of divisiveness, a lot of unrest, and all of that makes for a bit of an unsettling time. Um, the good news from all of that is that we are surviving, we're making it, I think we will you know, get over it, um, but it does create uh, issues. I think um, the good, other good news is that in the CPA market, things are really not bad. Um, all the firms I speak with locally, small, medium, and large, are doing fine. Um, yes, it's uh, disruptive in certain ways, but um, you know, CPAs are an essential service, and if anything, they're more needed now than ever before. Um, what I'm seeing also is obviously a continuing need for dealing with succession. And I'm happy to see we have buyers and sellers online and people that are sort of not sure because the, uh, the time is now. I mean, if I had to say one watchword for this presentation, it would be a sense of urgency because uh, if you're a firm that you know you have succession issues, whether it's age, health, quality of life, or whatever the reason, you know, it, it's gonna happen. And we're gonna talk today about a lot of things that are going on that hopefully will help you. Um, you know, the, the basics of accounting firm success have not changed these ideas of growth, profitability, and, and specialization. But I will share with you, because I, I plan to be as, as blunt and honest as, as possible in this session, it's all true, but I would say that it's not really happening in the small to mid-sized firms unless there's a major effort put into it. And I've gone to plenty of map management of accounting practice sessions, and there's always a lot of talk about this, but um, you know, small and mid-sized firms don't really have the luxury or the finances or whatever to afford a growth partner. So unless you have a champion, it's, it's very hard to deal with this stuff. Um, I will throw out to you, I'd be happy to help any way I could in, in recommendations because there are a lot of people that are really great at all this stuff. So uh, um, my cell phone and email are below. So feel free to call or text anytime about any, anything we talk about today. Um, you know, getting into the M&A market, um, Valuations have been trending downward for, I would say, probably five to 10 years. It wasn't unusual not that long ago for firms to have multiples of 1.5 of collected revenues or higher. And it's been a slow downturn. It's not precipitous. COVID-19 has fortunately not made that precipitous. Um, and if anything, it affects both sides of the transaction, the buyer and the seller. Um, what's more normal now is a one point multiple or a little bit higher than that or a, a blended rate but we're gonna get into some of the nuts and bolts of the mergers in a, in a couple of minutes here. Um, <clears throat> selectivity continues to be an important factor. Um, during the merger craze in the 90s and or 2000s, there was a lot of emphasis on top line growth, not at the expense of specialization and geographic and all that kind of stuff, but more and more now, firms that are looking to acquire, and I know there's people online now looking to do that as well, are looking for specialization, getting into a new geographic area, younger staff, younger partners, specializations, et cetera. Um, I don't know if many of you have heard the expression orphan firms. I didn't invent that myself, I must tell you, but 
what it means is firms that have some significant issues, they would be generally a one partner or two partner firm that is not really totally up to speed with technology, remote work, adequate staffing, the age of the client base could be an issue. These are firms that definitely have some issues and there really are a lot out there and they do very well. They don't, they don't do badly because they have a, a good revenue base and they may have high margins because of low overhead. But if you happen to be one of those firms or you know people like that, it's just something to be aware of and uh, to, to be uh, cognizant of. Um, at the same time, um, deal structures have also not changed. As Rick mentioned, my prism is the New York metropolitan market. And I will say here that almost all of the CPA mergers and acquisitions are based on earnouts or retention. Um, I'm glad to have a, a national audience. And if things are done differently, I know in some parts of the country, bank financing is not unusual. It's not something that I see much or really see hardly at all in the New York area. But certainly, uh, you know, chime in with a question, a chat, or, you know, contact me afterwards. I'd be uh, always interested to learn more about how other parts of the country operate. But there are essentially <clears throat> three types of deals that happen. Um, there's the merger to acquisition, which most of you are probably familiar with, which is typically a smaller firm um, merging into a larger firm, obviously. And the principles are, um, the founding principal and the ongoing partners are gonna work two or three years and then enter into a deferred compensation arrangement. Um, the other um, one would be a merge of equals. That's also something that is more of the medium to larger firms than the smaller firms. Um, when you have a half a million dollar firm or a million dollar firm, the idea of merging with an equal doesn't always create enough of a critical mass to make a difference. In fact, generally, one thing that I'm always concerned about is when firms that are too small consider merging, are they compounding their issues? If they had staffing issues before, this may not go away. If they have uh, you know, business development issues, same thing. The, um, the third type of deal structure that is not on this slide, which I realized last night when I was looking at it, is the internal succession. And it's a joy to see and be involved with. I happen to have two of those going on at the moment. These are firms, uh, specific examples, a, a million and a half firm and a $5 million firm here in the New York metropolitan area that both have partners that are much, much younger. So they're about to embark on a transaction for the founding partner to cash in a certain percentage of the equity and enter into a plan for a full exit over the next two to five years. So um, the interesting thing that's come up from the internal succession and talking to the younger partners is they're actually very concerned about the, all the institutional knowledge and relationships, even though they're working on all the clients, the founding partner, probably you know, 30 or 40 years in the business has a tremendous amount of knowledge and that transition has to be handled very carefully and, and obviously the, the continuing business development. Um, the components of the transactions are what we're looking at next year. And uh, you know, the big topic is always the valuation and the multiple. And there's many different factors that go into that from the type of clients they have, <clears throat> the um, realization of the clients, the profitability. Um, one thing I am seeing in that equation now is the concept of recurring revenue. Um, up until this year, recurring revenue was pretty easy to figure out. It was the last fiscal year, calendar year, most recent 12 months, and it was essentially what was collected, perhaps backing out any one-time special projects that were really not the norm. Um, but now with COVID, what we're seeing is um, some concern and some higher client losses in certain industries. And I've had you know, a couple of recent experiences where um, you know, there's been a agreed upon by all parties, you know, haircut, whether it was uh, 15 or 20 percent of the annual collections are not going to be continuing for the foreseeable future. And you know, all sides are agreeable to that. And obviously, my business is involved in that as well in terms of sharing in the, uh, the pain, if you will. Um, the other thing that can be done with valuation multiples, and I, I see more frequently, is what I will call a blended rate, where a firm might put a higher value on certain parts of the business and lower value on others come up with a rate that sort of uh, melds them all together. Um, the big factors that need to be dealt with as quickly as possible in, in these discussions and um, are the, what's mentioned there, the compensation, equity, deferred compensation, and I would add to that the name of the firm. Um, we'll talk about it a little more later, but the sooner those things are ironed out, 
the better because it is obviously a very labor intensive type of process. Um, the last thing here is probably one of the more controversial and I'm certainly curious by chatter otherwise what the audience feels about this, but obviously a demerger clause is something that almost every seller would like to have. Sure, it would be nice to be able to get out and, and no harm, no foul. And I would say that most acquirers would rather not. My feeling is I am not really in favor of those. I think that both sides should have as many meetings as necessary, as much due diligence, as much background checking, as much everything, and go into it with full force. It's going to work. The first year may be really, really difficult, but um, and if for some reason something unforeseen happens and it, it doesn't work out, work it out amicably as people, and you know nobody really wants to spend a lot of their time and money on litigation when it's just things. Sometimes things don't work. Fortunately, I can tell you it's it, it's a rarity. Um, one of the other new things going on in the market, which again, I'm curious about other people's thoughts, I have not seen anything about COVID clauses where that was specifically mentioned in either a letter of intent or a deal document. Um, I've spoken to a couple of attorneys in this area, and at this point, that is not considered, if I pronounced it right, a force de majeure. That would be one of these one time earthquake terrorism one-time event that negates the contract. Most of you may have seen that term in a, a document of some sort. Um, there are, I'm not going to go into all the details, but there, there are four factors that affect whether an act, an act is qualifying for that. But the bottom line is something is not really a force de majeure unless it totally prohibits the other party from functioning and ability to function. And in the accounting firm world, even as bad as this pandemic is, it's not stopping firms from doing their business. So at this point, I don't see that being a major factor in the CPA merger market. So moving on. Uh, <clears throat> if you're a seller, I can't emphasize enough starting this process early. Um, as mentioned before, you know, based on your, your age and everything else, you're, you're going to do something. It's going to be by far the biggest financial transaction you make in your life. And it's just so much better to be prepared and start early. And that's why I suggest a year or two and um, get the information that you need. Um, it is a very involved process. And it's so wise to talk to people, you know, that have gone through the mergers themselves, whether it's friends of yours or people you can seek out, attorneys that are involved in these type of transactions, and even, even, even people like me, so that you go into it with your eyes wide open um, and don't spend a lot of time and not have things end up the way you want them to. Um, I think one of the best sources is your state society. Um, if you're not involved, it's just a great way to meet firms and build new relationships. And as I note here, the vast majority of these type of transactions happen without somebody like me involved. Um, <clears throat> Preparing your firm is really important. Um, not many people do that. One thing that I would suggest, and either to try to do it yourself or consider getting an outside marketing person to help with it, is create almost a one pager, something that extols the virtue of your firm. A little bit of the background, selling points, industry specializations, partner bios. That's you know, one thing you can do to distinguish yourself in the market because because of the trends in the market, there will be more and more people selling and it's going to be harder and harder to distinguish yourself and get as much value as you possibly can. <clears throat> when you're in the process, it's very easy to establish the relationship as you start having, if you're having meetings with prospective buyers or acquirers, um, you know, during the first meeting, it's going to be very obvious how the chemistry is, how the rapport is, all these people you could possibly work with. So before, you know, you may be very surprised, but before you know it, the economics of the deal are going to be in the forefront. And these five items that I mentioned here, I would recommend highly having them ready probably even before you start the process of talking to other firms, because um, if the, the chemistry is almost always going to be good, and if the finances and economics don't work, then nothing much is going to change from there. Um, I know it's hard sometimes to get the information together. It may be hard or uncomfortable sharing all this personal financial information, but you do it under an NDA. And in all my years of doing this, I can tell you quite honestly, no one's ever had a problem with information getting in the wrong hands or anything bad happening. So um, 
And I would also suggest, even if there's not somebody like me involved, to consider some outside representation. Yes, you will have an attorney, hopefully an attorney that has been involved in these type of deals before. Um, but consider even, you know, there are people in my business, I, I do it myself, of course, but on an advisory basis, not on a full merger and acquisition assistance basis, reviewing documents, talking about deal structures, reviewing letters of intent, you know, being your independent advisor. And it is something that, you know, can pay off in the long run for sure. How many of you, I know you can't answer the question to me directly, but I would ask how many of you have been involved in deal discussions to acquire practices or even merge your own practice that went on for a very long time, multiple meetings, and then didn't work out? Besides me, because that, that, that's the nature of my business sometimes. But the point being here, going into it with realistic expectations can make a world of difference in the success of the ultimate uh, conversation. So um, the things that I mentioned here, just if you go into it knowing what is realistic, it works out much, much better. Um, philosophical, philosophical and ethical considerations. What I mean by that specifically is um, each firm has their own threshold of how comfortable they are with clients that want to take very aggressive tax positions or very aggressive financial reporting positions. And that's you know, worthy of conversation because if it's a major gap, it is going to be a problem. Uh, another example that comes up in that context is in the nature of uh, non-business expenses. Everybody, most firms have some things that are not quote, technical business expenses, but I've run across some major exceptions where firms just take that a little bit too far. And uh, in one case in particular, many years ago, it was a reason why a deal didn't work out because they just couldn't come to grips with that. I should have underlined the word any discomfort because when you go through this process, if there's something that's troubling you, it, when everybody's on their best behavior, it's not going to go away. And I would go as far as saying, if you have any discomfort, just simply do not make the deal. Um, sometimes it takes some time to figure it out. But my personal experience is most of the time, the discomfort comes with in terms of personalities where you just don't feel that comfortable with somebody, whether it's too big of an ego or whatever the case might be. Um, anybody who's been involved in these deals knows that the, the first year is incredibly hard with all the different transitions, um, but that's just something you have to go into fully expecting it. I don't know that many firms do this, but I do highly recommend <clears throat> doing background checks, both sides on each other, the partner group. They're fairly inexpensive and worthwhile because if something comes up that you couldn't find doing internet searching or background, other background checking, better to know. And what I'm talking about specifically is a credit check, criminal check, driver's license check, and others. It's probably, I'm guessing, $150 per person to do it, and you get a lot of information that can only make you feel good or having avoided a problem. Um, due diligence, talking to a group of CPAs, saying, why would I bring up due diligence? That's something you can do in your sleep, and I'm sure you can do that in your sleep. What I have seen, though, in my experience is that it's not always done as aggressively or as fully as it should be. Um, there's a trust factor involved. Sometimes there's a lot of excitement about making the deal and it's not attacked as much as I would like to see. And specifically, I've been talking about making sure the cash receipts are there over the last couple of years, making sure there's not a problem with litigation or excess receivables, which might indicate some management issues. So there's a lot of things that could be dealt with. Um, one of the handouts in this session is a due diligence checklist that I put together a couple years ago, and I would certainly recommend because it's extremely extensive and can certainly save you uh, some time. And the transition plan, I put that almost in the same category as due diligence. A lot of times it's done a little bit too casually. Um, I recommend a very detailed plan, you know, the 10 or 20 steps in transition, what's the timeline for getting it done, and who's going to be responsible for it. Um, I realize all these things take a lot of time, but obviously nobody wants to make a mistake. I wouldn't minimize the, um, the change in your life if you are a founding partner or senior partner at a firm and you are looking to merge, need to merge, and you do find the right people to become new partners with. You know, all of a sudden, you're not the one sitting in the corner office. You're not paying the bills. You're not deciding all the hiring and firing. And it's a, it's a, it can be a difficult transition. I think with the right new partner group, it becomes less painful. 
and the firms that are really good at this recognize that. Um, I may be mentioning this out of order, but I also say for those of you that are acquirers, the firms that do the best at acquiring other firms do a fantastic job at figuratively putting their arms around the other founding partner, the other senior partners, making them welcome, and also not counting the days until they transition out. The um, firms that I know that do a lot of these type of deals very successfully, even after the buyouts, are totally happy with those partners staying around. They bring in clients, they get involved in the other activities, and they can get paid for it as well, even after their buyout is complete. So continuation is um, a good thing. Um, one other thing that I didn't mention, I'll just make sure there's nothing else here, no, um, is one of the other trends that's going on is mergers and acquisitions among a little bit of an older group. And I hope I'm not saying anything out of turn here, but there's a lot to be said, and I've seen some of these deals happening, of firms where the partners are not, they're retirement minded, it's not mergers of equals, but these are firms where the main active partners are in their mid to late 50s. And they have another 10 or 15 years to go, depending on health, and they can be a very viable um, merge in prospect for those firms looking to acquire. Um, the quote unquote younger CPA firms made up of CPAs in their 30s and 40s, they're, as you probably all know, there are not a lot of them out there. And let's be realistic. They want to be like you. They want to be their own boss. They want to grow their own firm. And um, so consider the firms that are a little bit more mature in terms of um, merging in. I think that is it on my end. Um, That's terrific. I'll just end by saying it is a fantastic profession. I am honored to have been part of it for 35 plus years. It's still one of the most trusted out there. And everybody should be very proud of what they do for themselves and their clients. So continue all that good work. Robert, thank you very much. Terrific presentation. And you made it in under 30 minutes. That's why we call this a 30-minute flash briefing. <laughs> <laughs>